Good morning or afternoon. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange, the Native Plant Project, and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Using Native Plants and Fuel Breaks, presented by Mark Williams with the BLM. Before I introduce our speaker, I will go over some webinar details. If you have questions for the speaker or me, please type them into the questions pane of your control panel located at the top right of your screen at any time during the webinar. I will field the questions for the speaker after the presentation, but it helps us to have questions lined up in the queue throughout the webinar. I also want to let you do, or I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the, we the webinar presentation, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio pane and check your audio selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Mark Williams recently joined the Bureau of Land Management Salt Lake City Field Office as a Natural Resource Specialist. He previously served as fire ecologist in both Nevada and Wyoming for the BLM. Mark has been involved in resource and fuels management since 2001. Welcome, Mark, and thank you for presenting today. Thank you. All right, I will make you the presenter now. <clears throat> All right, looks good. Okay, thanks. Um, I renamed this presentation Strategy for Fuel Breaks in Arid Landscapes um, to better reflect some new information that I added. Um, but much of this material really comes from a talk I gave on using native plants for fuel breaks um, last April. So if you showed up for native plants and fuel breaks, this will include all that information. So just to give you a, a quick outline of what I'm going to be going over, uh, first part, fuel breaks, what are they, what's the purpose and why do we need them. Um, then the second part, I'll, I'll kind of explain or, or go through a couple of different types of or commonly, commonly used fuel breaks. Um, and a lot of those use non-native non -native plants. And this is really sort of a narrative on how or why we switch from using non-natives in fuel breaks to these low-growing native plants. Um, and that's what we'll talk about in part three. Uh, the next part is really about uh, how do we implement these fuel breaks, um, what are the sort of uh, methods. And then the last part, um, a, a section that I sort of just added on choosing the right seed to plant in these fuel breaks. So right from the start, um, I want to introduce a little caveat, and I, I should have done this in my talk last year. So I'll be presenting some information that's from the scientific literature, peer-reviewed literature, some which is really anecdotal experience, um, some from mine, some from other people's work, and then some which is really just my own opinion. And I'm going to try my darndest to differentiate um, those statements as I proceed. So according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, invasive species and wildfire are two of the biggest threats to sage grouse and sagebrush habitat. And we're, or most of us are, that are probably listening today are familiar with those natural dynamics in sagebrush where you had open to closed stands of sagebrush uh, with understories that were dominated by perennial bunch grasses and forbs and had fairly long rotations, uh, could have varied anywhere from 50 years to greater than 200 years, uh, just to paint on the species and subtype. And then how that's changed with the introduction of um, invasive annuals like cheatgrass and medusa head, um, which have invaded these sites. And when we get fires in there, we get an increase in cheatgrass. And the more cheatgrass we have, the more fire. And the more fire, the more cheatgrass in this sort of endless uh, fire cycle until we, uh, we're, we're stuck left with these invasive annual grasslands that are mostly devoid of um, perennial vegetation. So I'm going to present just a little bit of data on fire in the Great Basin and sagebrush ecosystems. And I'm going to really start from uh, broad scale and moving down to a little bit more fine scale. Um, this information is from Bill Baker in 2013, the Annals of AAG, where he asked the question, is wildfire increasing in sagebrush landscapes in the western U.S.? And he did this range-wide. So this is 
the entire west or the entire distribution of sagebrush. And what he found is that um, when you're looking at that scale, trends are really hard to detect. Um, he did find a, a, a weak trend for large fires in the last 12 years. So over this 25-year period in which he was looking, um, it does appear that there have been more large fires um, more recently. Um, also found that large fires are, or large fire years are climatically driven. Uh, they occur um, really during drought years that are preceded by years with above average precipitation. These are things that uh, a lot of us have probably noticed on our own. And that fire rotations uh, are shorter now than historically in these four provinces. He sort of subdivided the uh, distribution of sagebrush in the provinces. So for example, Snake River Plain, Columbia Plateau, those types of uh, really broad scale uh, groupings. So fire rotations are shorter now than historically in four of those provinces, and it's the provinces where cheatgrass is more common. So cheatgrass is, seems to be playing a role there. And this is really um, probably the biggest, the biggest concern for this increase in fires the, for these sagebrush types where recovery is slower uh, than the current fire rotation. So if it takes uh, 60 years for a Wyoming big sagebrush to recover, whatever that year might be, uh, in your geographical location, and the uh, fire rotation is 30 years, uh, your, your areas are never going to fully recover. Uh, this study is by Jennifer Balch et al. in Global Change Biology. Uh, came out later that year. And what she found, um, she compared uh, burned area from MODIS fire data with landscape, with a, with a landscape cover map. And she sort of tuned it or uh, narrowed it down just a little bit. This really covers a lot of the Great Basin, uh, a little bit of the Mojave down there in the south. And she found that cheatgrass grasslands were twice as likely to burn as sagebrush over this uh, 29 or, or 30 year period. And then although only uh, cheatgrass only comprised 6% of her study area, 24% of the total area for these large fires uh, was comprised of cheatgrass land cover. So these areas that are really dominated by cheatgrass cover. And she had these one kilometer, um, one kilometer resolution land cover maps. So I don't know if you guys can see my cursor here, but uh, these areas in red are cheatgrass. And I sort of outlined where the Winnemucca District BLM office is in lots and lots of, um, and that's in purple, lots and lots of red uh, in our district. So we're, uh, we've been, particularly hit hard by um, cheatgrass in those fires. Um, moving right along down here, now just talking about uh, a little bit smaller area. Uh, so since 1999, six of the 14 largest fires in the lower 48, that's outside of Alaska, have occurred either in the Winnemucca district or those adjacent BLM districts to those like Twin Falls, Elko, and that sort of thing. And, and over that time period, we've had 29 fires over 100,000 acres. So these are very, very large fires. Um, definitely a a major trend for um, for fire in these areas, and these are the areas that really have a lot of cheatgrass cover. So moving over uh, to that image on the right, um, this is one particular landscape in the Winnemucca district. It's right on the uh, Nevada-Oregon border. This is the Lone Willow Population Management Unit. It's an it's an area identified by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a sagebrush focal area, um, part of this whole uh, range-wide analysis on um, uh, protecting greater sage grouse and keeping them from being listed through the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and you can see um, we've had some areas that have burned three or four times since 1984. Um, this is from Landsat data. Uh, a good chunk of this landscape is burned, that of which contains sagebrush, a lot of the stuff there. Uh, out then is, is greasewood. So a lot of these areas are they're not only just burning, um, but they're, they're burning multiple times. And that mountain range on the western side of the Lone Willow is the Bilt Creek Mountains. And that one's been particularly hit hard, as you can see by this map. Um, in that area, we've had 61 fires since 1984, over 1,000 acres. So. Let's um, move on to part two here and talk about fuel breaks. So fuels management in rangelands is um, really constrained to modifying these fuel properties 
uh, to reduce fire spread and intensity. So we're modifying attributes like fuel loading, fuel continuity, um, in a lot of cases composition, trying to remove annuals and introduce perennials. And the goal for these are to either slow down or stop advancing wildfires or to reduce the intensity of wildfires to allow suppression resources, um, sort of give them an, a, a safe place to, um, uh, for fire suppression. So the first type of fuel break that I want to talk about are brown strips. And these are really bare dirt. Uh, fuel breaks, uh, generally uh, a disc or two wide. We generally do one disc width wide. Those can be anywhere from 12 to 16 feet. They have to be maintained yearly, uh, which is one disadvantage. And we generally treat those after the major vegetation growth, um, but prior to fire prone conditions. We, we have had one contractor that did inadvertently start a fire uh, when he was uh, implementing the, implementing the uh, or retreating the, um, the fuel break itself. Uh, and that generally occurs in late May, early June. Just really depends on the season and the type of rainfall that we're getting. Um, these have been very, very successful. And we, uh, you can see from the ignition density map on the right, uh, those lines there in pink are, uh, this is a highway coming just north out of Winnemucca. It's Highway 95 that goes up toward Boise. And it's an area where we get a lot of human-caused ignitions. And we implement these fuel breaks really within the highway right away um, where we're getting lots of human cost ignitions. Uh, these have been very successful. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons we, we think that they're, they have been so successful is because they really limit the distance from where the ignition point is, which is usually right along the highway. It could be someone's trailer. It could be they're dragging a chain. It could be a vehicle, fire, whatever it might be, but it limits that distance from where the ignition starts to where it hits the fuel break. So there's probably not more than um, you know 20 or 30 meters at the most and between where it starts and where it hits the fuel break. So the fire really hasn't built up in intensity. Uh, and then we, we stop it right there uh, as best as possible. You know, we get firefighters in the scene and they're uh, really the ones that put that fire out. And another reason is because um, these fires really aren't aren't in alignment um, with the winds uh, when they hit this fuel break. Um, they really, most of the impacts along the fuel break are in these sort of flanking and backing type conditions. Uh, but they really do protect these large blocks of continuous fuel or uh, large blocks of uh, sagebrush habitat that do occur along these uh, transportation corridors. Um, this is just an example of some of these uh, successes that we've had with the highway disking fuel breaks. Um, we get success when we have moderate burning conditions. So say the mile marker 147 fire. Uh, we had ERCs of 74 and BIs of 54. These are just indices that, that sort of uh, give you an indication of what the fire growth might be. So the higher number, the more potential for fire growth. Uh, all the way over here to the Coder fire in the lower right where we had ERCs over 100 and a BI of 94 and honestly completely stopped the fire right at the fuel break um, right, even without uh, suppression resources getting there. I mean, obviously, they, they put the, the front out, but uh, very, very successful fuel breaks um, that we've implemented. Uh, the next type are, of really common fuel breaks are green strips. Um, and these use fire-resistant vegetation that stays green later in the season than other vegetation. So that's the, the science behind implementing green strips. And for the most part, we use, or I would say 100% of the time, we use non-natives for these uh, species such as crested wheatgrass, uh, forage kochia. Uh, I've seen uh, intermediate weed. I've seen people use alfalfa, uh, all different types of, um, of species, introduced species. So the question is, do these green strips work? And I think the answer is really sometimes they do. Um, they, they have been uh, successful, and there are lots of documented cases where they have been successful. So this example here comes from the uh, Milford Flat Fire, which at one point in time, uh, I'm not sure if it still is, was the largest fire in Utah. And what they found was uh, they had this 30-acre patch. They planted forage kochia, Russian wild rye, and crested wheatgrass. 
And this was one of the only areas within this fire that did not burn in the Mill Free Flat Fire. And you can see from this uh, image from the right, uh, lots and lots of kosher there on the ground and not much sheet grass growing in between it. So just one instance uh, where planting of these non-natives uh, seemed to uh, stop the fire uh, just by itself. So why do you use non-natives and what are the advantages of those non-natives? Um, one of the things that's commonly mentioned is we have better establishment and dry sites, uh, better competition with annuals uh, such as cheatgrass and medusa head, and if they stay green longer into the growing season. So as I was reading this, I see uh, I use the word purported, um, which really has probably a pejorative uh, connotation. And I I meant to to mention this at the beginning of the talk, but I. I I don't want to demonize folks for using non-natives in fuel breaks, uh, even though it's not my preference. Um, as an agency, I'm, I'm an employee of the BLM, we want to have that full complement of tools available to us. And the science behind um, you know, planting non-natives and increasing fuel moisture is, is sound. I mean, it's basic S190 intro to fire behavior type classes um, that we do as uh, as an agency and as uh, fire uh, professionals, um, but really I'm I'm biased and I'm a, you know I plan to present a pretty solid case for the use of natives here. Just wanted to throw that in there. So let me talk about some of these problems with non-natives. Um, the first one's going to be competition, and um, I borrowed this slide uh, from Dan Harmon and Charlie Clements to ARS over in Reno, and. Uh, what we find is crested wheatgrass, and I'll try to go through both crested and kosher. Those are the two main species that are used in, in green strips. Um, they really don't effectively suppress cheatgrass during these high precipitation years. If you take a look at that, uh, this is really a slide from a presentation that they gave. Uh, on the right, you can see this average drier year. Uh, you can see lines of crested. Um, when you have these drier years, the crested wheatgrass does suppress uh, cheatgrass, at least you know, fairly well. It's a moderate suppression. And if you look over on the left, um, this was a wet year, um, you get really very slight cheatgrass suppression. And there have been, there have been several other studies that have looked at um, various species, uh, Russian wild rye, and um, here's one from Francis and Pike in 96, uh, which found that crested wheatgrass didn't effectively reduce cheatgrass, uh, and then again, similar studies have been done on a lot of these other common, uh, common use, commonly used plants in green, in green strips. Uh, unfortunately, I did not get a lot of information uh, from forage kochia. There's just not a lot of information about its competitive ability, ability out there in the scientific literature. But as we know, um, these large fire years are um, during drought years, they're preceded by uh, years with above average precipitation. So if the uh, species like, for, like uh, kochia and crested can't suppress cheatgrass during these wet years, and those are followed by drought years, then you get this really uh, large areas that are susceptible to wildfires. So you get this increased uh, fire risk um, in these fuel breaks. Uh, the next problem I want to talk about uh, with the use of non-natives is fuel loading. And this photo here, I think, really tells it all. Um, this is a picture of, uh, of a, crested, a nice crested wheatgrass stand. Uh, crested wheatgrass is often described, uh, characteristic as wolfy. So it'll get wolfy after it's, uh, after it's uh, established for a while. So it's, uh, it's much taller and it produces a lot more biomass than a lot of the native plants um, that grow in the Great Basin. And, we know that the height and total biomass of fine fuels are directly related to increased fire intensity and fire spread, and that uh, grass fuel loading overall is positively correlated to increased fire, uh, fire frequency, especially in these really arid landscapes. Um, and I would say that as far as using forage kosher, I would say it's uh, not as big of an effect on fuel loading. So I just want to try to give you both sides of that uh, crusted sort of kosher use um, in the use of green strips. Uh, the next problem with non-natives is expansion. Um, this is the commonly cited uh, paper for 
uh, folks that are using 4-Edge Kosh. I know a lot of people don't like it, but uh, it's Graham Muir 2013. I, I think it might be in Journal of Range Management. Maybe it's in plus one. What they did is they went back to some former plantings of 4 Kosha uh, sampled sites, and what they found is uh, on 89% of the sites that they sampled, uh, Kosha had spread into unseated areas so that it's, it's expanding. And the mean distance that it was expanded was uh, just over 200 meters uh, with a rate of about 25 meters per year. And I think maybe the most disturbing part is um, it's not just expanding into disturbed disturbed areas, but also in tax stands of sagebrush, which is probably the most, um, makes me a little bit more cautious. And this photo on the left, uh, this was a, a treatment we did in Winnemuc on the Double H Mountains. This was forage kosher that was planted at about 6,000 feet, and it did really, really well. Unfortunately, and it spread, uh, spread really well. Unfortunately, this is uh, some general habit. It's a part of a GHMA, or it's general sage-grouse habitat, and we're having a hard time now establishing sagebrush in these areas. And so we did some sort of experimental treatments by burning kochia and burning some of the, the grasses in there to create more, uh, a better seed bed for uh, sagebrush reestablishment. So there, there are definitely some issues with forage kochia and, and expansion, and it sort of expands out outside of those areas where you intend it to stay. Uh, the next problem uh, that we've run into with non-natives is this drought tolerance and fuel moisture. So this is one of the purported advantages or one of the advantages of, um, that's listed for the use of non-natives. And um, I'm not sure, uh, at least for crusted wheatgrass, that this is uh, a really a valid, um, a valid advantage. Um, there's, a, there's an example from the scientific literature. It's uh, Frank, 1994, in Journal of Range Management. And he did some field trials where he planted both uh, western wheatgrass, which is a native, uh, and crested wheatgrass uh, in field conditions. And actually found that western wheatgrass was more drought tolerant than crested wheatgrass and stayed green longer into the growing season under these drought conditions. And um, in actuality, crested wheatgrass has this drought escape uh, versus this drought tolerance strategy. So in these uh, drought years, it cures early in the season, it senesces, and then it just becomes this increased fuel load uh, and becomes more susceptible for wildfires. I would say, however, this is not the case uh, for kochia. I do believe kochia stays, uh, does stay green late into the year and does effectively maintain moisture better than uh, a lot of the natives that we have or a lot of the natives that I would use in my fuel breaks. Um, provide a little bit of anecdotal evidence for um, for crested wheatgrass here on the left, uh, we find that crested really has has good establishment in our sites that have a greater than 10 inch precip zone. That's where we see better establishment of crested wheatgrass. Uh, but in those areas, we really natives are natives do really well there uh, as well. So natives are thriving in the same locations. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of places where we're putting our fuel breaks and a lot of our district is in this five to 10 inch precip zone. So this photo uh, right above that box is from one of our fuel breaks. This is in a, a six to eight inch or so precip zone. It was drill seeded with crested and kochia. Um, might have been a little bit of Indian rice grass. And you can sort of see what you get in these, uh, a lot of times what you, what you will get in these drier sites. Uh, sort of oh, sparse establishment of crested wheatgrass and, and really, um, even at this sort of moderate level of uh, grass cover, we don't get a lot of suppression of the cheatgrass. Uh, you can just tell from that uh, image right there. So the next part I'm gonna talk about why we actually switched to low growing natives. Um, and a lot of this was really just chance events. And then also some, some common observations that we made in the field. Uh, we gave it a shot and uh, found quite a bit of success. So that's what I'll talk about now, uh, the first one uh, came. Uh, I got I um, got to the Winnemucca district in 2012, and the, some of these photos are, are older than me. But these were monitoring photos uh, from some of our fuel breaks. Uh, let's start in the upper uh, left. Uh, this one was taken from April 2009. This is in a 10 to 12 inch or so precip zone. 
up next to the Santa Rosa Mountains. This is um, this was drill seeded with crested wheatgrass. Uh, I'm not sure what year, but this one this picture was taken in April 2009. You can see there's really good site occupancy by crested wheatgrass, like excellent occupancy. However, if you go over to the upper right, uh, this one was taken in July of 2011. Uh, you can see the, the definitely the crest that is staying green into the season. We're definitely in the fire season in late July, but not much suppression of the cheatgrass uh, surrounding it. And then um, I should, should mention that 2011 was an above average precipitation year. Uh, and then going down to the lower left hand corner, uh, going in sequential order, July 13th of 2012. This again was a drought year, uh, one of, a really big fire year in our district. You can see what the crest of wheatgrass uh, looks like this year. This is essentially just a, a continuous fuel bed uh, all the way as far as the eye can see. And what happened was we had the buckskin fire come through here and burn across this landscape um, without any, uh, didn't care whether it was crested or, or natives or whatever it might have been through there, uh, and burned for about 11,000 acres uh, with some pretty under some pretty good burning conditions admittedly and this was uh, adjacent to grouse habitat by the way uh, the next sort of chance event uh, that led to uh, our switching was um, the hot springs fuel break uh, here's a picture of that fuel break on the left hand side of this slide in April 2009 same year this one was actually drill seed with um, Poa Secunda crested wheatgrass and forage kochia and fortunately for us the crested and kochia didn't uh, didn't really establish uh, there is uh, there are a few crested wheatgrass here and there and very 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 few kochia however we have great cover um, with Sandberg's bluegrass uh, and you can see that in that uh, lower left image um, Really good cover, and I would estimate somewhere around 20 or 25 percent without pulling up my monitoring data. Uh, switching over to the right, uh, this was taken um, taken by me in September of 2012. Uh, there was a fire that occurred, the Hot Springs fire, in October of 2011 that burned 35,000 acres. And what happened uh, is the fire. Uh, this field break is right along this existing two track right here, and the fire burned all the way up to the two track and the fuel break. Um, and really stopped along a large uh, a large length of that. Uh, it did jump the fire or the fuel break uh, at that far eastern end, so we can't call it a complete success, but um, it was actually really, really successful and was brought up uh, during the ARs uh, and by some of our suppression folks as being a, one of the fuel breaks that really uh, aided them in uh, their suppression efforts. And I just want to notice, note that uh, you can really tell if this area didn't burn. There's a lot of uh, sort of this unburned fuel from when we mowed that fuel break um, originally, maybe back in 2007. And one of the things I wanted to mention about Poa Secunda is, although it doesn't stay green uh, late into the year, I mean, it cures really, really early, but it has really, really low fuel loading. Um, and in this case, it uh, just by having that really low fuel loading, it stopped this fire that really burned under pretty good conditions for an October fire. Uh, some of these other common field observations are these uh, islands of, of bluegrass and a sea of cheatgrass. And we, we see these really all over the district. I'm sure uh, folks that are listening see these as well, where you get really good cover of natives. Like these are all, I believe, Sandberg's bluegrass. You really get complete suppression uh, of the cheatgrass around that. And that's one of the things that just came up over and over um, as I was doing uh, my initial survey through through the district and uh, had a big impression on me. So uh, we know from some studies, uh, we have uh, Gergen et al. 2011, these are some research folks out of uh, University of Nevada, Reno, uh, this one in plus one. They found that uh, native species such as squirrel tail and Poa secunda reduced cheatgrass biomass by 50 to 60 percent. So these perennial plants um, are highly competitive with, uh, with cheatgrass and really um, another study down below, this one from Booth et al. 2003 in Journal of Ecology, at, at pretty moderate levels of cover, at 15 to 20 percent cover, 
Um, species such as squirrel tail and Poa secunda can almost completely eliminate uh, cheatgrass uh, within our fuel breaks. Uh, there's been some additional studies since then. There's one by uh, Jeannie Chambers. This, this uh, photo here on the lower left, though, this is actually from one of our fuel breaks um, that was drill suited with, um, with all natives. And this one right here, we had 25% Poa secunda cover and only 2% cheatgrass. And I feel like this is a, a fairly effective fuel break um, that we've been able to implement um, in my time there in Wanamaka. So why natives? Let me talk about those advantages here. Um, I've mentioned some of these a little bit uh, in some previous slides. The first, that they're low growing. So you have really greatly reduced fine fuel loads, especially in those really dry years. I mean, post secunda may be one to two inches tall. So uh, really, really, really low fuel loading, uh, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, drivers of uh, fire spread. Uh, second one, they're highly competitive with cheatgrass. Uh, many, many studies documenting this uh, competition with cheatgrass and completely excluded at full occupancy, as in our slide before, uh, both studies and, and anecdotal evidence. Uh, very drought tolerant, um, and some species may even stay green later in the year than some of the common non-natives that are used. And in my opinion, um, fairly resilient to disturbance, really depends on the, the season of uh, grazing and those types of things. Um, pretty disturbing to wildfires, um, and they've been in these landscapes for millennia and had uh, ample opportunity for natural selection to um, select for those uh, traits that uh, make them resilient. And um, some mixed evidence uh, for better establishment in dry sites, and, I, and I'll talk about this just a little bit later in the presentation. So how do we implement um, these native fuel breaks? And these might really pertain to any fuel break um, in general. So the first step, um, in year one, um, some of these areas are still going to have residual cover of sagebrush, and you're going to—it's going to require mowing if shrubs are still present. And one thing to note is we always utilize existing roads um, when we're implementing these fuel breaks. It makes the fuel break much, much more um, not only effective by having that. Um, area that's devoid of vegetation, but also makes it so much more useful for suppression resources. If they can drive right along the field break, if the intensity is lowered, it just makes them so much more uh, likely to be utilized uh, during fire suppression. Uh, also, year one of establishment, if you have a high, uh, a high cover of invasive annuals, you will need to treat the field break with uh, pre-emergent herbicide, um, such, as, such as plateau. Um, and this is really to reduce that competition from cheatgrass. Reduce, you have to reduce that seed bank. So uh, you'll prevent uh, germination or you'll, you'll stop it from completing its cycle the next year, I should say. Uh, year two, you need to wait another year uh, before you can uh, drill seed these areas and put seed back in. Um, and you can use a variety of different methods, uh, range drill and printer. Um, there's a, a number of different ways that people uh, do seeding. We recommend using depth bands on a standard range drill or you can use a no-till drill. And some of those advantages and some of those things that make seeding with natives more successful or will make seeding with natives more successful is that it's at a better depth for these low-growing native grasses, um, unlike, uh, say, crested wheatgrass, which you know can be planted one or two inches in the ground. The, the, the natives really only need a quarter inch or so. And there's some additional advantages for using the, this lighter tillage method uh, as well. There's less impact to biological crusts. We know that biological crusts are important for uh, also reducing cheatgrass, uh, making them less susceptible, these areas less susceptible to invasion. Uh, and then really when you make these big disturbance areas, like if you use a conventional drill, you create this bigger, um, this bigger area of uh, disturbance for cheatgrass to respond, especially in subsequent years once your herbicide wears off, you're going to really have a, a much larger response uh, from those non-natives that you don't want back in there. So some seeding rates that we recommend, uh, I like to seed really high, anywhere from 7.5 to 15 pounds an acre PLS, so that's pure live seed. And some of those um, species that I recommend are um, 
course, Sandberg's bluegrass. Um, we use thick spike a lot, especially in sandy areas. Um, Western wheatgrass, if you're a little bit higher elevation, uh, I think it's usually a 10-inch. Um, does better, performs better in a 10-inch precip zone, similar to crested wheatgrass. Uh, squirrel tail, uh, Indian rice grass. If you're in a sandy uh, sandy site, some folks use uh, blue bunch wheatgrass, and then a couple of forbs there, uh, yarrow and and flax. Um, if those are going to be successful for you. And then we know that using these local, a local seed source is going to be more successful than, than those that are commercially available. And we have lots of uh, data that supports that. Uh, this one's from Owen Bauman in 2014, his, uh, his thesis. And these are just some examples, um, an example on the lower right of what these native species fuel breaks look like. So um, they look pretty good, really low fuel loading. One of the questions that we often get asked is, are these can we take a chance with a native species fuel break? Um, a lot of people aren't comfortable using native species for fuel breaks. They want to continue using, uh, you know, sticking to, inst to our uh, institutional conventions, so uh, using green strips and the use of non-natives. And they say, really, are these appropriate for this wildland urban interface um, type of fuel break? And we say yes. Um, the Winnemucca District has 13 federally recognized communities at risk. Um, Here's an example of a fuel break that we implemented right next to the city of Winnemucca. It just has a really high incident of human cost starts. We've had fires burn um, right into town. Here's an image uh, right here on the left of the Thomas Canyon fire in 2007 where it was uh, burning into people's backyards. So um, an area that's susceptible to wildfire and an area that we successfully implemented a native species fuel break right here. Uh, drill rows on the upper left some early establishment, you can see what the full occupancy looks like. And I, I showed this image earlier, but this was 25% cover with Poa Seconda and only 2% cover of cheatgrass. So pretty successful um, repression of uh, cheatgrass invading these sites. Um, and I should mention here, we, we also see, we seeded this fuel break with both Poa Seconda and with fixed bike. Um, and this is a, just a, one of those spots along the fuel break that was sandy. And you can sort of see this rhizomatous wheatgrass here. This is the Elemis lanceolatus that had really good, um, had a really good response to our last seeding. So the last part, I want to talk about choosing the right seed. Um, we talked earlier, I mentioned earlier that one of the advantages, uh, mentioned advantages of using non-natives is this better establishment in dry sites. And I, I see this a lot. Uh, and I've seen, uh, I could cite numerous studies here that, that show that to be true. Uh, and a lot, of those, a lot of those are being implemented in areas where you have a 10 to 12 inch precip zone. Um, and I think in those areas, um, though that might be the case, but I want to talk about why maybe that, that, that could be. So this, uh, this graph here is uh, courtesy of Jeremy James from UC Davis. And this shows the emergence probability uh, is on the left axis, on the y-axis, and sort of the species rank by from lowest to highest as far as how well did this emerge. And you can see we have um, crested wheatgrass or these red dots, and they, in general, had very good emergence. And then the natives were in these uh, green brown dots and had much worse emergence in Jeremy's field trials. I should mention, however, that Jeremy's field trials in included um, crested wheatgrass and then commercially available um, versions of these native plants. And that's what I want to really talk about next. So when we're, when we're looking at where the location of these commercially available natives come from, we find some discrepancies uh, well, anyway, this is just a map of where these cultivated varieties came from. So if we if we start over on the right-hand side, you can look at blue bunch wheatgrass. None of these are great based, and a lot of these are coming from Columbia Plateau, um, far northern Idaho, uh, western wheatgrass. We have one in Montana, another one down in Colorado, basin wild rye, one in uh, Canada, another one in Montana. Uh, really only one that even, there's only one commercially available variety that even comes from Nevada, and that's this Toe Jam Creek uh, 
squirrel tail, um, which was collected in a 12-inch precip zone over in the Alco district. So really a lot of these species, um, a lot of these cultivated varieties are coming from areas uh, where they might be, they're geographically um, separated from the Great Basin. Um, and then are also probably collected in areas that have higher precip. So this slide here and a lot of these uh, subsequent slides are, are slides are courtesy of uh, Beth Ledger over at UNR. And this was just one, one illustration of, of that um, map below where you have these commercially available varieties of native plants and where they were collected. So we're collecting these, these uh, commercial varieties and sites that are really wet. So for Nespar Indian rice grass, it had a, uh, a site. The site is, uh, has somewhere between 20 and 25 inches of precip. But we'll, uh, and so on and so forth as you go further over to the right, to so Rimrock, Trailhead, and so, um, et cetera. But where we're actually planting these species is really low precip. So we're talking you know, five, six, less than 10, inch, 10 inches of precip uh, for a lot of the fuel breaks that we're implementing. So uh, Beth and Owen Bauman did a, a study. They looked at data from 56 cultivars, cultivated varieties of native plants, uh, both grasses, forbs, and shrubs, to see what traits uh, were prioritized when they selected these cultivated varieties. And you can see that uh, a lot of these don't really seem to pertain to successful establishment in dry sites. So the first one is forage yield. Uh, we have things like uh, plant height, uh, beauty, um, seedling vigor and seed yield. So these are really plants. We're, we're really focusing on more production-based agriculture instead of focusing on maybe those traits that would be best uh, uh, prioritized for restoration and reclamation, um, you know, emergency stabilization after wildfire and restoration sites. So what are those characteristics that are associated with uh, increased plant performance? And uh, we have a number of sites or a number of studies uh, from Beth's lab over at UNR that have found that we, um, those characteristics are early green up, early flowering, early germination, small plant size, and then early root growth. And a lot of, these, a lot of those characteristics uh, sound very similar to what we get from cheatgrass. So these are the traits that we really should be focusing on um, when we're selecting these uh, varieties for uh, mass production to be used uh, on our public lands uh, in the Great Basin. So another th one of the things that Beth has been looking at is this variability. So even if you're collecting populations of plants, um, local, local varieties or local species to uh, put into your fuel breaks or your restoration sites. Even within that low precip zone, there might be some populations that are better at establishing than others. So what she did was she collected uh, 20 or 30 different, she collected, uh, I believe this is all squirrel tail, she collected squirrel tail from 20 or 30 different sites. And then she did a field, a field trial uh, at five locations, uh, I believe in Oregon and Nevada, there were a couple in the Winnemucca district, and she wanted to look to see how what the variability was in establishment and um, um, how how well they established, but also their survival. So she planted them out and looked to see what percent was present in June, and she found this amazing amount of variability, anywhere from 17 percent to 45 percent of these individual uh, collections were still present. So there's a lot of variability even in those local um, even, even within those uh, low elevation sites. So there might be some additional steps that we need to do to select the best seed uh, for use in, uh, in fuel breaks. So the next thing she did is she knew which percent of those uh, seeds were, um, she knew what percent would uh, result in better um, better establishment. She wanted to see, is there a way to actually predict 
uh, which of these populations are going to are going to establish better. So what she did is she took some seeds from each of those populations that she collected, and she took a look at some of those characteristics. And and one of those, she grew them out in a greenhouse. Uh, and one of the things that she found was uh, this. 10-day root length. So she grew them out in the in the greenhouse, and then looked at the seedlings when they were 10 days old, and measured the the root length. And what she found was um, she could really she had a, a really good way to predict which of those that are going to have really good establishment. And the R squared for this one was 50 was 0.5. So 50% of that variability in establishment uh, can be predicted with just one. Um, with just uh, one uh, characteristic, uh, and then she really found another model with root. Well, when she looked at not only the root length, but she added seed weight and the number of root tips, which you can sort of see from that image on the right, and she was able to get that model up to about 64 percent. So explaining 64 64 percent of the variability in establishment from these um, local collected locally collected populations. So, moving on to um, sort of our post-establishment management, I just have one slide to, to talk about this, and this is really has to do with grazing. When we implement fuel breaks, a lot of times we don't, we don't establish closures for livestock um, like we do for uh, post-fire management. Um, this slide um, I borrowed again from Dan Harmon and Charlie Clements over in ARS and Reno. This slide is, is actually from a wildfire that occurred in Winnemucca District. Um, this, I believe this was on private land where they, where they had their study. And they drill seeded crested wheatgrass and maybe a couple other non-natives in these sites. And so they had this is what they considered, considered uh, really productive perennial grass. Starting to get some cheatgrass suppression, um, already decreased seed bank of cheatgrass. And this image on the left was from 2010. And then they went back in 2012, and 2012 was a drought year. Uh, we got four and a half, less than four and a half inches of, of precip, and the permittee really didn't adjust, um, didn't adjust their livestock use in this pasture, this allotment, and continued to graze it pretty heavy um, in the springtime when these plants are, are a little bit more susceptible than they are after the growing season. And they measured an 85% loss in those perennial grasses just in one season. So proper, proper, um, proper grazing management is one of those things that we, we don't talk about a lot with our, um, in our restoration programs or in the Bureau in general, but this is one of the things that can have a, a pretty big impact on our success. So uh, summary slide. In, uh, in summary, um, I have some advantages and disadvantages of both using natives and non-natives. So as far as fuel height, uh, natives really have the advantage here. Uh, real low growing, uh, even forage kosher is, is going to be much taller and have a lot more biomass um, than uh, poa secunda or, or squirrel tail. Uh, fuel loading, the natives also have the advantage. Uh, as far as competition with cheatgrass, uh, again, I give the advantage to the natives. Um, and I, I think this can be backed up in, in the literature fairly well. As far as fuel moisture goes, uh, if you if you take out crested wheatgrass and you just consider forage kochia, the the advantage is going to go um, to these green strips with with using forage kochia. There's no doubt about that, and that that's supported in the science, and it's a uh, um, you know it's a valid it's a valid use of of using forage kochia in forth breaks. As far as drought tolerance, um, sort of made this split or made this sort of an even. Uh, made the advantage even because it really is going to depend on that species, whether you're using um, what variety of crested wheatgrass, what variety of kochia, and also the species of uh, native that you're using, uh, and even within those local populations. Uh, resistance to disturbance uh, also sort of made this even because we know that a lot of these non-natives are pretty resistant to disturbance, um, heavy grazing, they respray after fire. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of advantages um, for both of those. As far as sage grouse habitat goes, I, I added this one in there. I think the advantage just goes to natives. If you have fuel breaks that you're implementing, uh, say adjacent to some uh, ACECs or uh, sage grouse habitats, some of our uh, NCAs or national conservation areas, 
uh, and you don't want expansion of kosher entities to sort of spoil the naturalness. I think the, the use of native fuel breaks is a, is a really good option for you. And then um, as far as difficulty, I think implementing a native species fuel break is much harder than implementing a green strip using non-natives. Um, it just is. The, we've, we've spent, uh, Obama and I had this conversation uh, when we were doing, uh, at one point in time, a couple of years ago, and, and he mentioned that we've, we've spent 50 years, or they've, the industry has spent 50 years working on, uh, for, on crested wheatgrass, trying to get that to, to better establish in these really dry sites uh, and using these fuel breaks. Uh, but we haven't really spent a lot of time working on these native plants. So I, I think there's, there's some work to be done. Uh, you have to collect local varieties, um, really testing those out and field, field trials is um, something that um, is a good idea and um, just to, to in general, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, I wanted to plug uh, this technical note that was done by Jeremy Maestas um, and a few others to help review. Um, it was just, just came out the last month. It's called Fuel Breaks to Reduce Large Wildfire Impacts and Sagebrush Ecosystems. Uh, you can Google it, um, just put it in Google, uh, it'll pop right up. Uh, Jeremy's a, a wildlife biologist who works for NRCS, and he's got a lot of experience in sagebrush ecosystems. And then there's also this Great Basin fact sheet, number five, which came out through the Great Basin um, Fire Science Exchange that was work done by Moriarty et al. up in the Boise BLM district. And so I wanted to take some time and make sure that folks knew that there was uh, other information out there on fuel breaks that they could utilize to help them make decisions on uh, what type of fuel break they want to implement, how to implement them, and, and so on. And with that, uh, I've got some time for questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right. Roger Ferriel has a few questions. Do fuel breaks alter the fire frequency for an area? If so, how? If the I mean the, the goal of, of fuel breaks is to reduce over overall across a landscape is to reduce the number of acres burned. So if you reduce the number of acres burned in a particular area, you would necessarily reduce the fire frequency. So they would reduce the fire frequency and they would do it by reducing the number of acres burned. Okay, great, thanks. Have you used intact low sagebrush plant communities for natural fuel breaks? Yes, we have. So I, I guess the other type of fuel break that I, I really didn't mention is um, you can use, you can a lot of times use natural breaks um, in your fuel break design, uh, and you can even use uh, different veg different uh, sagebrush subtypes. So using low sagebrush is, is one fuel break that we have done. Um, sometimes the low sage can get a couple of feet tall and we will go ahead and mow those areas. But usually the understories aren't as heavily invaded with cheatgrass and that rural vegetation it doesn't really require seeding. So they're, they're automatically native, native fuel breaks um, just by themselves. So sometimes we just use the low sagebrush depending on its height as a fuel break. Sometimes we'll actually mow it, um, but uh, generally those aren't areas that we would seed. Okay, great. What elevation were your fuel? What elevation were your fuel breaks? Would fuel breaks um, composed of native plants work at less than three thousand feet elevation? So the. The elevation for our fuel breaks probably go anywhere from 4,000 feet to greater than 6,000 feet. Uh, we have we have hundreds of miles of fuel breaks in our district. Um, some of them in sagebrush habitat. Some of them along those um, major highways. Some around um, cities and towns. Those communities at risk and that wildland urban interface. So I, I think there's a there's a wide variety of elevations and locations in which we um, we implement um, and when, where they're implemented. Do I think they would work at 3,000 feet? I think they would. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, 3,000 feet in, in Nevada is really low, but 3,000 feet in um, eastern Washington maybe not be that low. So um, it would hard, be hard for me to, to say um, if you've got 
a six inch or above precip zone, I think you can implement a, um, a native species field break. Great, thanks. Linus Meyer asks, has there been a comparison of the hydrologic effects of using natives and non-natives? Also, has there been any use of biological crust solutions to assist in fuel breaks? I, I don't know the answer uh, for part A about the hydrological studies. Um, it's not something I've, I've searched the literature for. Um, as far as the biocrust solution, no, that, that's something that we've actually talked about um, in, the, in the past is how can we, in these areas that normally have really low vegetation cover, is there a way for us to put these bio community or bio crust back in with some sort of spray solution? And I think that's something that, um, that our USGS research, researchers are working on right now. Great, thanks. Rob Feigener asks, how do sage grouse respond to brown strips, green strips, and native fuel br breaks? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't want to come out and, and say that, well, I've seen sage grouse in them, uh, because I've heard the same thing for spotted owls and clear cuts. <laughs> um, we don't really know. Um, what the impacts are. We haven't, we haven't really, as far as I know, looked at the, at the implications for, you know, in population dynamics. What I can say is this, when you implement the fuel breaks along these, along existing roads, along an existing disturbance corridor, you're minimizing that, that habitat fragmentation, which should limit disturbance to sage grouse overall. Okay, great, thanks. And what are the biggest barriers to wider adoption of native fuel breaks? Um, probably two things. Um, institutional convention. Green strips have been around forever. Um, they're, a known, they're a known quantity. People know that, that they've worked. We have documentation that, they, that they've worked. And they're easier. There's not as much. It, it's just easier. We have these commercially available varieties of non-natives that, um, especially in a 10-inch plus precip zone, are, are proven to establish pretty well. And as far as the natives go, it takes a little bit more work. Um, we have used the commercial, uh, commercially available varieties um, in our fuel breaks. But we're also working on collecting our own local populations. Uh, we worked with Beth to have some more populations tested so we could uh, increase those um, at a uh, commercial farm uh, to then put back into fuel breaks and restoration projects and that sort of thing. So it takes more time and it's, a, it's just a lot more effort. And I think that's probably why they haven't been more widely accepted. Great. And I think you probably just answered this question, but Mark Musso, uh, Mark Musso asked, are you doing your own source identified collections for natives for grow out contracts for fuel breaks or relying on previously collected and produced material? Um, to Mark, we've done both. So one of the commercially available varieties, and it's not widely available, um, there was one that was a Jordan, Jordan Valley variety that was grown out by Benson Farms, and it, and it was it was a local collection that's just north of our district office, and I believe it was done by the Vale BLM, the original collection. And it was within our seed zone, and we were able to utilize that one, uh, that variety for one of our fuel breaks. But we are also working on our own collections. Uh, Peggy Olwell gave us some Seeds of Success money. Uh, it's a national program for the, for the BLM. And we got some money to make our own local collections. Those collections are ongoing, um, and we have them tested. Uh, to look at which populations might be best in these really arid landscapes um, through the lab, Beth Ledger's lab at UNR. And we're currently working on a, on a grow out through a contract with Benson Farms uh, up in Moses Lake, Washington. Great, thank you. <clears throat> well, that looks like the last question. Thank you all for your participation. We would greatly appreciate it if you would take our three-question survey of this webinar that will appear after the webinar has ended.
I will post the recording of this webinar on our Great Basin Fire Science YouTube channel this afternoon, and the link will be automatically sent to you through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow. Our next webinar, Sage Grouse Forb Preference by 12 Plant Categories, presented by Roger Rosentrutter, BLM Idaho Retired State Botanist, will take place next Thursday, May 5th. If you have further questions regarding this webinar or have requests for future webinars, please email or call me at any time. Again, thank you for your participation today, and thank you so much, Mark, for your presentation. Thanks. All right. My pleasure. Great. Have a great day, everybody.